Welcome to another episode of the Soothing Semantics Podcast. I'm your host, Rafi Pinsky. Make sure to subscribe, like, comment, share the episode. And without further ado, we have William O'Donnell on the podcast. You can follow him on william.odo on Instagram. He's a Long Island real estate agent, investor, and a pretty cool dude from what I see on Instagram. We haven't met yet. But he's also a mutual friend of uh, Alon Avgi, who's quite an interesting and uh, well-known real estate investor in the Long Island area, who's just just now building a hotel. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, yeah, pretty it's wild. Pretty, cool it's stuff. pretty pretty wild stuff, man. Dude's not even thirty yet. Amazing. Cool stuff, man. Indeed. So so William, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, great to have you. Thanks for thanks for putting it together, man. Absolutely, dude. So uh, give us a little bit. I have a couple of solid questions for you. First off, how did you initially get into real estate as an agent? And what were you doing prior? Yeah, so I was doing a bunch of jobs before I got into real estate. I thought I wanted to become a psychologist. Everybody in high school would come up to me with their problems, and I thought I was pretty good at listening and giving them advice. So I said, you know what? This is what I'm going to do for a, a career. I'm, I'm going to become a psychologist and talk to people. So I said, I'm going to go to college. I went to a local community college. I didn't have much money, so financial aid offered me X amount of dollars, and that was able to cover the community college tuition. So I said, let me go to this college. Um, I started going to Suffolk Community College, and uh, while I was going there, a little after high school, my parents, they had separated, and so my father was the head of the household, and where we lived, we lived in an apartment building at the time, two-bedroom was around $2,200, which was a lot of money at that time, this was 2015-ish, and my mother, she worked, but she probably made $1,500 a month. So we obviously couldn't afford that after my father left. So we either had to get kicked out or leave the apartment. But the issue is we had nowhere to go. You know, four kids, single mom, not much of an income, no vehicles, no assets. So my mother had a friend in church that had a home. She had a high ranch and this high ranch had a one car garage. They were actually going through a foreclosure, but they offered that space to mm -hmm. us. So we knew that we could go there, but be on a clock because the sheriff would come and evict us all eventually. So that's where we ended up going. We lived in that garage for about two years, no heat, slept on the floor, the five of us. And then my older brother, he went off to college. So it became four of us, three kids, my mom. And that's all where it started. I started going to college when I lived there. Uh, it was very so wait, tough. So this was a garage. This garage had no separations. You were all in just one open space. Is that what I'm it, understanding? Right. It it had it had a separation for kind of like a bedroom. So it was it was finished. It was a finished space, but it was the size of a one car garage. Um, you know, so wow. that that's that's where we're living. Um, you know, and. We, we're we're living with mice. We're living with roaches. The property was very uh, neglected. And so, you know, we would have to sleep in three layers plus a coat, you know. So that's that's where I learned really to just hate the cold. I had this hate for, for cold weather um, because of that. I remember going to high school one day, giving my notebook to the math teacher, and she looked at me and she said, why is why is your notebook so cold? And I said, I looked at her, I said, I don't have any heat. And I could see her, the tear drop forming in her eye. It was very unfortunate. And so I'm going to college. I'm working three jobs while I'm going to college. So I'm a landscaper, I'm a lifeguard, and I'm working at a place called Bubba's Burrito Bar. So I'm delivering burritos. And while I'm delivering burritos, I actually had uh, gotten my license at this point. I got my real estate license. I read a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And as soon as I read that book, I said, man, I got to get into real estate. I got to get into real estate because if I can make money without working, it spoke about passive income. If I could get some passive income, even if it's $50 a month so I could have dinner with my family on, you know, based off of that passive income, that would be a home run to me. 
So I said, let me get my license while I'm going to college, while I'm working those jobs. And that's what I did. So while I was delivering burritos, I would hand out my cards. I would ask every person I'd deliver food to, hey, have you thought about selling your home? And they'd look at me like I had two heads, like, what do, what do you mean? And say, I, I'd say, I'm actually a licensed agent. Here's my card. If you ever think about it, give me a call. And that's how I started my business. I'd then quit delivering burritos. And what I did was, while I was a lifeguard, while I was going to college, and while I was doing landscaping on the side, I had a goal of knocking on 100 doors a day. So that's how I built my business, knocking on doors. Uh, and then I, and then I, uh, merged cold calling into that. So that's how I got into the business at 19 years old. Wow. Wow. That's a lot, man. Yeah. Um, um, and I, I relate to you a lot more because I also grew up in a, you know, coming from a poor household. So I really, it's really always nice to talk to someone who grew up in a tough environment and was able to completely switch around because I I saw based on one of your reels you mentioned that five years ago you had nothing that's right and that's not a long time ago that's no you, you know there there's this saying I I I heard a few years ago and it said uh, we tend to overestimate what we can do in a year, but we underestimate what we could do in five. And so I would have never imagined that I would be even where I am now, you know, five, six years ago. If you told me, I would have looked at you and thought you were crazy. It's really, it's really amazing, man. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, wow. That's a, that's a powerful story, dude. I just, I grew up in a basement in New York living with my grandmother, you know, so we we also during the winter time, I had to put plastic on my windows. I had to kind of tape the, the, the plastic against the wall. It was it was this insulation plastic that I found at I think ShopRite in New York or whatever. And that's what I had. And I had to use an extra space heater. We had heat, but my bedroom, all the cold would come through during the summertime The the heat would come through. Most of the most of the time we didn't we couldn't really afford air conditioning, so I just uh, used fans most of my childhood. And then once I started working, I had a little bit of extra money to kind of put towards the bill. But it was, uh, <laughs> you know, well, we didn't get evicted, but it was pretty pretty basic stuff, you know. Wow! Yeah. So that so, yeah, New man, York weather, you. man. Huh? That New York weather. Yeah, I'm surprised you still live there, considering how much you had to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I did move to Florida. I I moved to Florida in 2021. We moved to Fort okay. Lauderdale. We came back. What happened? Well, after uh, well, we got a condo on Federal Highway, right on the border of Fort Lauderdale and Pompano Beach. Uh huh. And my wife and I, you know, we moved in. December 26th, the day after Christmas, we drove down from New York, moved everything in our two cars and we're having a great time. And then January, January 6th, we went on vacation at uh, the D uh, in Dominican Republic. And uh, while we're there, my wife takes a pregnancy test. That's when we found out she was pregnant with the with the with our first daughter. So we said, you know what? You know, after a month of coming home, I'd see my wife throwing up, upset, emotional roller coaster, no friends, family support down in Florida, emotional support in Florida. We said, you know what? I was flipping this house I live in now. And I said, hey, why don't we move into this house? Why don't why don't we we're going to surprise my mom January 29th coming up with the news. We're going to come up to New York, give her the news that my wife's pregnant and at the same time, I brought my wife here to come look at this house. And, you know, it's a five bed, three bath, 3000 square feet. It's got a, everything we, we, we need and, you know, or could want. And after she saw it, she said, yeah, you know what? I want to be closer to family. I need the help. This is our first baby. Her whole family's in Colombia. So, you know, my mom, my sister, my brothers are here. My grandmother's here. So that's just what happened. So you just, okay. 
So because you didn't really have the support, you just went back to the cold. Yeah, I, d I didn't want to see my wife uh, yeah. suffer the way she was without that without that support. Right. You know, yeah. I was I was working all day. She was at home by herself. Yeah, that's tough. You know, I had I had to do in my mind, the right thing was to put her in a better situation. You know, her mother had recently passed away, too. So it was tough on her emotionally. Hard, yeah, I hear you. OK, so so I mean, do you in an ideal world, you would have liked to stay as so long as you had the support. Probably. Probably, maybe looking back now, um, I mean, a lot more potential, at least in my eyes here in New York, business potential, opportunity, more potential for, uh, you know, increased income just because of the network and business that I've built here in New York. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that had a lot to do with it, too. You know, I was starting from scratch in Florida. Of course, there's a fire alarm. How wonderful. Okay, we're, we're, we're good. We're done. Yeah, so I'm listening. So you had a, a larger network. Yeah. I got you. Okay. Uh, so so kind of, so we, we discussed, you know, family. We discussed uh, upbringing and, and what it was like living in a garage. How have you scaled your business? Are you still a fully active agent? Because that's what it seems like. Do you, do you have... How many people are, are working for you at this point? You know, kind of give us a scoop of how things have gone in the last five years, you know, where you are, where you are now. Yeah. So today I run and manage a couple of different businesses. I have a flipping business. So we manage uh, construction crews, go in, buy properties. We fix the properties up and then we sell them for a profit. That's one business is the flipping business. Uh, last year we profited from that business, probably around $300,000. Then we have the sales business. The sales business does around the same, around 300 in three, three to three fifty in gross commission incomes. Uh, we have, uh, uh, virtual assistance when it comes to the sales. So we have admins that do a lot of, uh, paperwork for us. We have a a team of callers that go ahead and, and cold call, they get us listing leads or they get us uh, leads to, to go ahead and flip, you know, kind of like the cash offer deal. Those are, those are all out of, sorry, those are all out of the country, right? I'm assuming those are all out of the world. country. Yep. Those are all out of the country, virtual support. Yep. Right. My friend of my colleague of mine tried that. He, he said it wasn't really getting him the, it wasn't really getting him anywhere. How many people, how many guys do you have calling you calling for residential leads? No, aside from flips, how many guys do you have on a daily basis doing that? Residential leads? Well, I would I would combine the two because these people are calling people with a very simple script. Would you consider selling for the right price? Some of those are retail, some of those are distressed sellers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we probably have a team of four people that are making calls right now. I've hired a consultant. This consultant has helped me build this business. He owns a, the call center. And the benefit of that is he trains these people. They barely have any accents. They're very well trained with objection scripts. And, uh, you know, it's it's been great. It's been great. And they're calling how many hours a day? And Nine to five. Week? They're calling full time. Yep. We, we wow. expect anywhere from, you know, one to two leads a day, one to two solid leads a day. Wow. And these leads are converting. You're getting sales from these leads. It's, I mean, it sounds like a, a silly question, but that's it's awesome. Oh, yeah. We could expect, you know, anywhere from three to four listings a month from the, from the system and at least, you know, one solid wholesale or flip deal a month. Wow. And how much do you think this is costing you a month for all these guys? This is costing anywhere between three to four thousand dollars a month. Well worth the money. Well yeah. worth the money. I hear you. Okay. Yeah. No. I, I from the one friend that did it, it didn't. Maybe he wasn't doing it enough at scale, or maybe he just didn't have the right. He didn't have the right scripts. You know, it seemed like he was pretty new to it and didn't really give it that much time. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> listen. If you try to reinvent the wheel and do things yourself. 
the likelihood of you hitting the nail on the head are very, it's slim to none. Whereas if you just go ahead and take what somebody else has implemented that has had a proven success and just implement it in your business, then, you know, it's like a GPS, you plug in the address, it's going to take you to the destination, you know? So this guy had a proven track record. I hired this guy, he plugged whatever he had into my business and it's taking me right to that same destination. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Cause I make, I make calls at least five days a week. And that's where I've gotten most of my business. You know, I'm about three and a half years in. So, you know, not brand new, but also not 10 years in. But that's, you know, I'm, I really focus on listings. I make my calls all the time. I'm getting better. I'm learning new things, but I'm a comfortable cold caller. You know, I've been doing it two years prior to real estate as well. I was in sales too. So I'm really, really focused on that. I'm dialed in. And then... My corny ass. And then, um, you know, I'd like to do this. I'm also hearing about all this AI that's going on in terms of virtual assistance or, or cold calling. You know, I don't know how, I don't know how good it is. Cause if you can tell it's AI, that definitely doesn't sound promising, but I'm sure, sure that's eventually going to be very, very solid. And it'll probably be even more affordable and you can just have it going all the time. So, I mean, and there's just so much you can do with it. Imagine you're calling, you know, imagine you're calling to say in Florida, you have a lot of people from Colombia or people from, you know, Venezuela, Argentina, Chile, Peru, any of these countries, they have property or Brazil, they have property in, in Miami. And if they're currently living in their countries, you can call them, say the hours are different and you want to call them and you would normally be sleeping, you can have AI give them a call and say, hey, you know, we know you have a property in this in this city. Are you interested in selling? Do you want to buy something? You know, I'm just I'm kind of just thinking outside the box here. But that's pretty awesome. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I'm, I'm looking to learn more about it. I just spoke to I actually just called somebody yesterday and he was telling me that he has a friend that's really revolutionizing something AI related in that regard to make so I'm, I'm going to keep talking to him and see what he can do. So on the, on the investment space, are you, have you kind of, now that you have that, the calls automated, have you shifted over much more so to the investment side in terms of flipping and wholesaling? Is that more of your bread and butter now? That's what I'm focusing more on now. I'm focusing okay. more on acquiring properties, flipping those properties. I see a uh, much more potential for me to grow my income on that end of things. And I'm also creative, creating inventory uh, by doing that. And the product here sells incredibly quickly. So, uh, you know, if I could bring inventory to the market, uh, I know it's going to sell. If I could get that inventory, that product at a really good price and create that equity, uh, you know, I, I know I'm going to do very well. We just closed on a flip uh, this week, actually. Uh, you know, that, that brought us more than a hundred thousand dollars in profit. We closed on a flip about, a uh, a month and a half ago. That was about a $200,000 profit. And, wow. you know, uh, we don't have to deal with the sellers that are unrealistic. A lot of sellers may be unrealistic and, you know, you, you do everything for them and then they don't appreciate it. And so I went through a lot of that being an agent and it's like, you know what? I'm going to call the shots. I know what deal I should be taking. I know how I want to do things and I'm in control, you know? For sure. So how did you, okay. So look, give me, give me the, the rundown on the, on these two flips, the one where you, where you uh, took a hundred K profit and the one where you took a 200 K profit. Give us like a little rundown on how, how you sourced it. Uh, you know, what kind of house it was what the construction looked like, you know, cost wise and, you know, a little bit of a synopsis on how you, how you went ahead and, and did it. So both of those deals were referrals through having relationships, either with agents or bankers in the area, they referred the deal to me. So we have purchased the property, both properties on average cost about a $70,000 rehab. And after I'm, I'm in the industry now, seven years. So, you know, I I've, made the contacts. I've gone to Home Depot, browsed around. I know what the materials cost. I know what the labor costs. So I have an idea of what things should cost. 
Is Home Depot just, the most fun part of it, by the way? Because I don't know why I feel like it is. Uh, well, you know, it it's it could be a little annoying. I'm I mean I'm uh, I could sometimes be impatient, and so when you have to go pick up materials and you don't know where they are, you could spend an hour in Home Depot just searching for a couple of items. So, you know, I mean, I guess if you're not purposefully going there, uh, because your time could be better used at dollar productive activities if you're not purposefully going there for a job and you're just kind of browsing around looking at stuff then yeah that that could be fun but if you're there to go buy materials when you could have somebody that makes you know 200 250 dollars 300 dollars a day go do that instead and you focus on something because you make that in an hour you know right. your time is better spent elsewhere Oh, yeah. I'm assuming, I mean, if you're still doing it, you're probably going to be hiring someone to go and do that for you, you know, do the Home Depot work for you, throw everything in the truck. Oh, yeah, whatnot. exactly. That's uh, that could be a big waste of time. For sure. For sure. I, I, I'll just see I'll see big investors still doing it. And it kind of gives me that Gary Vaynerchuk garage sale energy where I think some people kind of just like to live in their in their older selves. And they'll do some of that work. This is just my feeling. Sometimes they'll do that older work just to remember where they came from. And so they'll do these kind of menial tasks that they don't have to do. They could easily outsource. So that was just kind of what I was wondering. Yeah, no, nothing wrong with that. Listen, I have a client. He's probably worth, you know, 15, 20 million dollars. And he's he's 70 now. And he does everything himself. And I think to myself, that is probably one of the dumbest things you can do unless it, it, it well, it depends on why you're doing it. If you're doing it because you're retired and you want something to do and you actually enjoy doing it, go do it. But if you're doing it to save a couple of bucks, I think it's one of the dumbest things that you can do because you're not you're not going to scale that way. If you don't have leverage, 100%. you're not you're not going to scale. I think it's also, I think for a lot of people, it's this sense of feeling in control. They don't really trust that anyone can do as good of a job as they will. And the reality is you can't be a pro at everything. You're going to have to give, this is just what I'm, what I'm understanding and what I've heard from very successful, uh, whether they be real estate investors, um, you know, anyone in, in any, in any space, you have to give some level of trust and you, you train them and you show them how you like to do it, but there are many of them that do it even better than you do. So you can't hold it. You can't just hold on to everything. It doesn't work. You don't have enough time in a day to do it all. So exactly. Uh, right. So throw So throwing it back, because I, we went a little off topic with the Home Depot. Uh, you, you were, were uh, referred the house or the houses to, from the bank. You said you, it costed you around 70 K for the rehab. Give us a little bit of, you know, back to where you were. Yeah, so we we fixed them up and uh, we we have a very straightforward marketing plan. We launched the property on the market. We always price our properties very attractively. They both sold over asking price and the rest is history, you know. Uh, we closed on those properties and made a, a a pretty penny. Um something that I can give of value to the listeners is structuring the deal like like let's let's go over a deal i'm buying right now I, I just bought this today saturday i just closed on this deal thursday i just bought this deal so this deal was actually on the market i was able to get this deal uh while there were five other bidders on this deal that bid way more than me i got this deal for 40 grand under asking the reason why is i there was an agent there i said listen i I don't want any commission. I'm not representing myself. I just want you to get me the deal. Send me a contract today. I'll sign it today. I'll give the deposit today and I'll close in two, two three weeks, whatever the seller wants. Because of how I was communicating with this gentleman and because of how aggressive and quick I was, I was able to get the deal for 40 grand less. Well, I think a big, a big uh, component was definitely, I'm sure there was the commission. I'm sure. And the commission it. too. The commission too, you know, I because you think he you think he just ended up taking the full whatever it was four five six percent. Well, it's not six percent a month. Yeah, he, he probably just he took the full thing. Yeah, I I saw his check at the closing. He he got paid on both sides, 
which listen, I'm fine with if that's going to get me the deal. You know, a lot of investors. That was that of- was probably a big that was that was a very smart move on your part because that was probably largely what did it. Not to say yeah, that I no, mean- not to say that you're you're you making things as smooth as they were, as opposed to you being some agent that didn't know what they were doing. You just made it seamless for this agent. You said, "Hey, man, here's an offer you can't refuse." From what it sounds yeah, like. and that and that's that's an an issue with a lot of people is that they they think about themselves too much. Let me explain what I mean. They they don't want to if they know that you paid x amount of dollars for a deal and you're you're making a hundred gram profit selling it to me. It's like that that immediately I've seen people like, oh, you know what? No, it's he's making too much money. I don't want to buy the deal. But if you buy the deal, you run the numbers, you're still going to make money. So who cares what the person bought it for? Or mm-hmm. or if if an agent brings me a deal, I ha- I will list it back with them at a full commission, 5, 6%, 10% if you want, as long as I make the numbers make sense. As long as the numbers make sense, I'm willing to do the deal. But a lot of, and I've dealt with this as an agent. I've so had you'll investors. Give, you'll give the initial listing agent your listing, even though you're a realtor yourself, you, you don't want to deal yes. with the listing. Yes. If you bring me a deal and you're an agent, I will list the, the property back with you. Because there there's a book called The Go-Giver. The more you give in this business, the more you get. Like I've gotten I've gotten opportunities thrown at me because that guy that that gate that got me that that deal, the banker, I wrote him a five thousand dollar check. You know, I didn't have to do that. I mailed him a five thousand dollar check. Do you think he's gonna want to bring me another deal? Of course. And people don't think about that. They're just, you know what? I'm gonna thank you do their thing. They just think about today, but they don't think about tomorrow. So it's all about relationships and, and how much value can you give out because it's only going to come back multiplied. Right. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, this deal, so, so I bought this deal for three ten. and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to explain how I'm actually flipping this this uh property with absolutely no money and i'm gonna make a hundred grand on this deal i'm not using any of my money at all (laughs) okay so i bought this deal for 310 and i'm going to spend about sixty thousand dollars rehabbing this property i just sold like three months ago the same exact property with a one car garage. The one I just bought has a two car garage. I just, and it needed work. The one I sold for five twenty five. So I know I could get five fifty for this, for this deal. So I'm in it for, let's say three ten plus 60 grand rehab plus closing costs. Let's just say I'm in it for 400 grand. There's $150,000 of meat on the bone. So the way I bought this deal was, I went to, I have a list of people. Anytime I sell a property, I know my sellers are getting money. For, they're getting proceeds from the sale. I always ask them, what are you going to do with that money? I'm paying double digit returns on anybody that lends me money. So I have a list of people that are willing to lend me money. Maybe it's 50 grand, maybe it's 100 grand. So this deal at 310, I go to a hard money lender, which up here we get pretty good terms. I don't, I think you could get the same terms in Florida where, they want 10% down for you to buy this property. So you need $31,000 to buy this property at 310. So what I do is I go to somebody on my list. This guy that gave me the money happened to be my landscaper. I know he has money, so I I I'd ask him like, "Hey, would you would you lend would you lend me 50 grand at 10% interest?" So he lent me the 50 grand. I used that 50 grand to buy the property. Let's say I needed forty thousand dollars, thirty-one thousand, ten percent down, plus another nine thousand dollars in closing costs. Let's say, so now I used his fifty thousand, forty of his fifty to buy the property. Now I got ten thousand dollars left, which is going to help me pay that towards repairs or just pay that towards interest payments on the hard money loan. So I got ten thousand dollars sitting in the bank after I closed on this property Thursday. Now, I I could do one of two things. I could either use a line of credit 
or I can go out and, and borrow more money from somebody else. But what I'm doing in this in this situation is I'm pulling a line of credit for another fifty thousand dollars. So now I have sixty thousand dollars. His ten plus another fifty. That's going to be used to fix the property up. And then when I sell the property, I'm going to make anywhere between a hundred. Let's say a hundred to a hundred thirty, because I'm going to have to pay a buyer's agent commission. Let's just say a hundred thousand. Super conservative. And if I paid. Six months worth of interest at 10%. Let's say I borrowed a total of $100,000. I would have paid about $5,000 in interest. So I invested $5,000 of my own money in this deal to make $100,000. Wow. And... You know, we're flip this is how we're flipping properties. We're we're using little to absolutely no money. And we're we're making these awesome profits. And this this is why I prefer flipping than you know dealing with annoying clients. Because you're completely in control. Yeah, it's true. It's true. You know, yeah, there's there's pros and cons. There really are pros and cons. To, to all of it, you know, if I mean, if you're selling enormously expensive real estate properties and you're doing it like water and you're getting a ton of them, you know, I mean, I know, I know agents down here who are making 10 million, over $10 million a year selling real estate. It's extremely far and few between, right? I mean, they're at the absolute, you know, cream of the crop of, of real estate agents, but, you know, they're making, uh, some of these agents are making over a million a month selling real estate. So that's, you know, that's, there aren't many real estate investors even doing that. There are definitely plenty of them that are, but you know, it's just, I, I guess, I guess it's nice to have both. Are you eventually going to completely leave the sales part or do you like to still have your hand in that and maybe have people under you? Who... I'm probably going to have an agent that handles everything. You know, because I do get referrals, so and re a lot of repeat business. So I'll have somebody that'll be running everything for me, and then I'll just be taking a cut. Right. Okay. And you think, and then now that you're doing the flips, are you going to be looking to get into development at some point? Do you want to, you know, venture into those things, or do you see yourself just doing flips for the long haul? No, so I own and manage a, about a a, a forty three unit portfolio. So I have I have forty three doors. Um, I have some property that can be developed. I'm just uh, you know, that's down the line. I, I'd like to focus a little more on that. I have a property right now that I could redevelop and have, you know, probably around twenty thirty units. That's ten units right now. Um, you know, I'm not selling that property. I'm, I'm definitely going to develop, redevelop that down the line. But right now I'm focusing on, on wealth, uh, building, uh, okay. you know, once, once I've gotten to a point where I say, you know, this is where I want to be, then I'll focus on different projects. But right now it's about accumulating wealth to me. Okay. But here's the thing also, when you talk about accumulating wealth, obviously you have 43 doors that's probably bringing you a nice amount of, do you mind kind of giving us- I'm a open book, book, man. You can ask me anything you want. Okay. Okay. So what what are those 43 doors bringing you, bringing in monthly approximately? Net. They bring me, net. I have partners on some stuff. So they bring me net, net around between eleven and $12,000 a month. Okay. And then, um, what was I? What was I going to ask you? So let's bring you eleven and eleven or twelve a month. And then, I got, I had one thing I wanted to ask you right away, and I totally slipped my mind. Um. Oh, okay. In terms of in terms of wealth building, where are you? Because you're constantly putting the money into deals. Are you relying on the income from doors? Are you just trying to accumulate a lot more doors and then use that that rental income to eventually do something else, say you know, such as development? Or are you holding some money in a bank? I mean, it may sound silly, but how are you how is how are you 
hold it. Let me let me try to frame the question correctly. Where is the money coming from, and where are you keeping it in order for that? Say you need, say you want to accumulate five million dollars, for for argument's sake. Is that going to come from the doors, or is that going to come from the flips? Is it going to stay in a bank account for the most part? How is that kind of working out? How how would that look? So so I have a very simple principle. All of the all of the income that I make. All of the act active income that I make, I don't touch. So I live off of the passive income and I use all active income to invest. I was just showing this to my my brother. He's my older brother is living in my house because he's he's buying a property right now and he gave his apartment in. He lived in Queens, so he's staying here with me now. And I showed him the other day, I was in my Chase app. I had about like 260 grand in my checking account. I said, look, you see this? Because I had closed on a flip. By Monday next week, there'll probably be around $5,000 in this account. Because as soon as I have a lump sum, I invest it immediately. I invest it in anything I can. Uh, it has to be an asset. It has to be something that's going to make me more money that's going to bring me passive income, that's going to appreciate in value. So just to give you an example, that money came in, I'm closing on a rental next week. So some of that, and that month, that profit from a flip is going to go straight into a rental. And whatever money I use to flip that property, whatever lines of credit money I borrowed, I'm going to take the original capital and reinvest it in another flip. And whatever profit, I take the profit and put it in a rental property. I buy a rental property. If there's any leftover money, I put it into an insurance policy. I put it into something, but I don't keep it. I don't keep cash. Of course, I have reserves, but that is in a money market account or like a Vanguard high yielding savings account. Right. But, you know, that's probably I have probably like a year's worth of expenses in a reserves account. But everything else is just always move. I'm always moving money. Right. OK, so then. That's that's kind of what I'm sure. So yeah, I understand many so many times you're cash poor, so is alone. You know, alone is has I don't know how many doors he has at this point, but he, you know, he's often very cash poor. And that's what a lot of investors, a lot of people are in that position. You don't want to keep a bunch of money sitting around in the bank. It's not making you any money. But that's that's kind of what I was just trying to understand is when you say you need to, you want to be building, accumulating and building wealth right now. If you're constantly taking the money and putting it into property, how much you meaning like you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, say you want to eventually buy some huge uh, commercial development. It's it costs, I don't know, uh, forty million. I mean, obviously you can get involved with partners and whatnot, but I'm just kind of, and you don't obviously you're not going to be putting that in cash. So that, I guess I'm just trying to understand it. You know, because when you say accumulating wealth, how much more do you need? How much more do I, how much, like, when am I going to stop? No, 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 no. I, I, it was more of how much do you need to start? I don't, I guess everything's very broad. I'm asking a very broad question. That's why I'm trying to articulate it a bit better. Because right now you're, what I was asking was if you're looking to get more into the development space, Say you buy a piece of empty land somewhere in Pachata, Pachatagu or whatever, whichever part of Long Island you're going to be investing in. Chog. <laughs> you, um, you know, there's an empty piece of land. You're looking to, to build a bunch of centers, a bunch of shopping centers. At what point do you say, okay, I'm ready to make that happen? I know it, it might be a bit broad. I'm doing my best here with the question. No. Do you get what I'm what I'm asking essentially? So let's say you have a piece of land or a property and that you know can be developed. At what point do you start put making the ball move forward? Correct. That's a good question. Um so for me it's building reserves because that it costs money. It costs money to have plans brought up, uh, you know. I think it's going to cost anywhere around $50,000 to have plans, permits pulled, 
get the get a get a place shovel ready is going to be around fifty thousand dollars in my opinion based off of what i have heard and so fifty thousand dollars plus holding a property for a certain amount of time until things get shovel ready so let's say you have to hold a, the property for a year you know and and your mortgage is 10 grand a month so that's a hundred and twenty thousand dollars 120 plus 50 and then you have to get financing to build that new development so what do those numbers look like and are they going to start charging you once the place is built or are they going to start charging you once you're ready to build because you need the money to pay the contractors and what are those holding costs going to look like? So it's figuring out what those holding costs are going to look like. And then are you prepared? Do you have that cash set aside to take on the project? You know, and I haven't even calculated what it's going to be for me to develop the piece of property that I have. It could be 200 grand. It could be 500 grand. I just don't want to even go there yet because I want to accumulate more properties. Once I'm older, I'm 26 years old. So, you know, maybe when I'm 30, maybe when I'm 35 and I'm at a place where I just have so much cash, I just have so much income, I just have so many properties. Now I'm going to play around with maximizing each property. Right now, I just want to accumulate properties. Down the line, I'll focus on maximizing my properties and bringing them to where they could be. I hear you. Okay. Okay. That's a valid point. Okay. Yeah. There's just, it's, that's, that's the, that's the wild thing about real estate investing is there's so many avenues and you can do things at different paces. You can use more of your own money and, and, and less of your own money. There's so many different ways to do it. That's just what, that's what's interesting. But then again, it's also the more I talk to different investors, the more I realize that there there is a simplicity to it. Once you kind of find your avenue, it seems to be pretty pretty streamlined. It's just a question of deciding which route you want to take. That's right. Right. Okay. For sure. For sure, Kansa. So, are there? Are there any other things investment wise that you wanted to to mention? Any tips, any advice, any quick little little pointers? Because we we covered a nice amount of ground. Yeah, I mean, listen, it for anybody that's looking to get started in investing, my advice is just living and being as frugal as possible, stacking as much cash as possible making as many relationships, connections as possible for when an opportunity presents itself, if the numbers make sense, you have either the money or relationships to jump into that deal and take action. You know, I I regret not taking action on so many deals. And that's the difference of people that excel in the investing world and not is the people that excel are the people that take more risk they take risk, they're also prepared to take that risk because mm -hmm. they've put themselves in that situation, that that position, either a cash position or either a relationship position. So constantly building those buckets, the bucket of relationships, the bucket of cash, et cetera. That's really good advice. It's really good advice. Yeah, I mean, and the more, you know, obviously the more knowledge you have, the more risks you've taken, the more you can expect the downside. Obviously, you you know you look at the numbers. You have an idea, a relative idea of what what's going on, but you also know that okay, if it goes south, I've been there before. I know what to expect, and I also have put myself in a position to be able to handle the setback and also bounce back from it. That's right. right. Yeah, that's just yeah, that's just common principle and and really anything. Okay, no, that's that's some really good advice. So so will. Thank you for coming on my show. Thank you for coming on to the Soothing Semantics podcast. It was a pleasure having you. I really, I learned a lot from you. It's your, your, uh, an inspiration. So I am uh, really looking forward to getting into the investment space myself. So I'll, I'll definitely, hopefully we can 
connect a lot more often, get to know each other better. Ladies and gents, I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Make sure to subscribe, like, share, leave your comments. Go and follow uh, William O'Donnell right now on Instagram. That's William, that's at William.odo on Instagram. He has a YouTube channel as well, so make sure to check it out. And, uh, you know, you could always reach out to him for any of your real estate needs in whatever capacity, whether that be sales or investment. So, dude, thank you so much. I look forward to uh, getting to know you. Great, man. Thank you for having me, man. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. It. it was a pleasure. I had a really good time. Thanks. Awesome, man.